From Collectivism to Connectivism. Part one, the way we are now. On the Thursday before last, in the middle of the night, the skies over the northern Italian region of Liguria opened up. Now, already swollen by days and days of heavy rain, the river Bisano burst its banks. It swept a 57-year-old man to his death. That muddy flow turned Genoa's medieval streets into tributaries of the Bisano. Floated cars downstream. It left them deposited like so many forgotten toys when the waters receded. And the floodwaters also swept through the dwellings in Genoa. It left them coated in a thick layer of mud. A portion of the city had suddenly become homeless. And that's when the emergency team swung into action. Now, I don't mean Genoa's emergency services. They were already very busy recovering people and property that had been caught up in the flood. And I don't mean the Red Cross or any other relief organization. This emergency team came from San Francisco technology startup Airbnb. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with Airbnb, the firm offers a simple service. A homeowner can list their own property, which is anything from a single bed to a whole home, on Airbnb's website at a price that they feel is appropriate. And potential reviewers, potential renters review those options. They contract a short-term rental with the homeowner, and that rental is facilitated by Airbnb. So the, the homeowner gets to turn a space that's spare into some money. The customer gets cheaper accommodation than they would at a hotel, and Airbnb gets a fee for arranging the deal, so everybody wins. And this model has proven very popular. It's popular with hundreds of thousands of rental properties now available through it around the world. And in just four years, the business has grown from nothing, from a startup, into the most significant innovation in accommodation. Six months ago, Airbnb raised half a billion dollars in investment capital on a valuation for the total business of 10 billion. Airbnb has become so successful so quickly that both hotels and municipal governments have taken Airbnb to court. They have been demanding that the homeowners who rent their homes through Airbnb and Airbnb be subject to the same regulations and taxes as hotels. And this is a textbook example of what we're now calling collaborative consumption. Airbnb provides a platform to maximize the utilization of an underutilized resource, extra space in the home. With Airbnb, the homeowner can modulate the availability of that resource to meet their own needs, respond to local conditions, and for, in for instance, a destructive flood. And so, responding to that emergency, on that Friday evening, Airbnb waived all of its fees to any of its customers in the Liguria region. Homeowners could offer up their homes, and the displaced could book into those homes, and they wouldn't have to pay a cent. And with that simple change in focus, Airbnb had transformed itself from an accommodation marketplace into a provider of emergency services. Presumably, their emergency response team made sure that Airbnb emailed and messaged all of the Ligurian accommodation providers to make sure that the word got out. An emergency service is pointless if people don't know it exists. Now, collaborative consumption is built upon the promise of a sharing economy, which recently has been vilified as a new mechanism for capital to alienate workers from their labor. But a sharing economy doesn't need to be a capital economy, because we share for reasons that have very little to do with economics. Altruism has never fit in very well with economic theory. It's frequently treated like the red-headed stepchild of economics. As a social behavior, Altruism casts aside the hypothesis of the rational actor, which is beloved by economists. It casts us aside for another consideration, social good. You open up your house to others because it's the right thing to do, and perhaps 
also because you want to make a show of your benevolence to the neighbors. Altruism must have a cost. So Airbnb pays all the infrastructure costs to keep its legion of computers up and running, and that allows the Ligorians to make their free accommodation arrangements, and the Ligorians need to carry the wear and tear of the homes that they open up to flood victims. Those costs, shared across an entire community, can be easily borne. And we've already built up a substantial infrastructure here in Australia for collaborative consumption. We have Airbnb for accommodation, we have Uber for transportation, we have GoGet for car sharing, we have TwoShare and reverse garbage and free cycle for all of the other items in our lives that we want to pass along. And it's not that none of this existed before. It did. It always has. But processes that were once very ad hoc, that were very local, that were relatively slow, well, they're all now fast, fast and efficient and global. So accelerating informal processes into formal systems, that creates something new. We've always shared, but now we share with everyone. And that acceleration in our sharing has less to do with the activities of any one business than the way we ourselves have changed. In the six years since the introduction of the, of the iPhone, we have collectively transitioned into a new form of society, a digital connectivism. We're continuously bathed in mobile broadband and Wi-Fi signals, and we maintain a continuous partial awareness of everything that's interesting to us. Well, what interests us? Okay, it's mostly friends and family, followed by locality and community, maybe the world. And these six years have seen both the rise of the smartphone and of Facebook, and that's not a coincidence. They're two sides of the same phenomenon. The mobile provides raw connectivity. Facebook puts that connectivity to work. It creates a scaffolding to maintain an awareness of all of our relationships. Now, we used to do all of that in our heads. We used to do all of that in person, and we still do. We haven't forgotten how to relate, even if now our attention is being torn in two directions simultaneously, both toward the real person sitting in front of us and the black mirror of the smartphone screen. And we're not very adept at managing the balance between the embodied and the connected. But it's early days yet. We have plenty more time to make a complete muddle of things before we learn enough from our mistakes to do better. Now the entire culture. And that's 5 billion smartphone users expected by the end of this decade. So we can safely make that an inclusive rather than an exclusive statement. So the entire culture now finds itself in a moment of reorganization. And there's a growing recognition that some of our best qualities can now achieve industrial era scale. And this hyper empowerment is rapidly becoming humanity's central project. This new global culture is going to be constructed out of countless moments where we share the best of ourselves. Some of those moments will have an economic basis, people renting a spare room. Others will be driven by the altruistic goals of a community, so that's people offering emergency accommodation. Some will involve things, such as sharing a car. Others will involve human ephemera, such as the sharing of ideas. And all of this is already going on. Science fiction author William Gibson once pronounced, the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Well, the future arrived last week in Genoa. It's hand forced by disaster. It might roll out a bit more gradually in South Australia until it's needed. Part two, what lies beneath. The material world fascinates us, but the far more interesting zone of human experience comes through our relations to others. We can do without the cars, without the homes, without the luxurious meals, but no man is an island. 
However independent we strive to be, we always rely and have always relied upon the constant attentions of countless others. We come into this world with an innate desire to connect and to relate with others. That's always been the path to safety and survival. We don't need to teach a baby to engage. Babies are naturally social. The drive to connect leads to the familial relationships that we all begin with and through which we learn to relate with others across the span of our lives. And from our earliest, we are constantly observing others. Babies move their limbs in synchrony with their mother's coos. We listen, we relate, we respond. All of that is entirely automatic. We don't need to learn anything, we just do it. And as our eyes begin to focus on the world around us, we become something that's equal parts sponge and mirror. We greedily watch everything around us and greedily ape the activities of those to whom we are trying to relate. We are perfect learning machines, soaking up everything in the environment. Infants absorb and reflect the experiences of their relationships, and we never stop learning. We're always observing the actions of others. And if we see something that helps us, we copy it. And this learning by observing is one of the secrets of our success. When we're small and have a lot to learn, we are deeply involved in the observation of others. We connect in order to learn, and having learned, we feel a natural desire to share what we've learned with others, both so they can imitate our behaviors and also so that we can rise in their esteem. Sharing makes us influential. It touches a deep wellspring of our need as social beings. Influence is another kind of relatedness. It's not based on the ties of birth, but on qualities that we begin to treasure as we mature, our capacity to manage and master our world. We live in a network of relations, some of blood, some of friendship, others of influence. And Every one of us has some social influence. Those among us who share most usefully, that is, those who share things who, which add to the capacities of others, those are the folks who have the greatest influence. And teachers, although underpaid and overworked, are highly influential. So we connect, we learn, we share. We've always done this. And it's the doing of these things that makes us human. But things are different now. Not for babies. They remain engaged to those closest to them. Yet, almost as soon as a baby is old enough to point, they're given a new kind of engagement, a touch screen that reveals the world. At first, that world is hidden away behind a game or something else that filters out the raw intensity of billions of minds. But at some point by the teenage years, that veil lifts, and the entire world is on display. The entire world can be observed. The entire world can be learned from. All of history, both for ourselves as individuals, and collectively as a species, has pointed us toward being able to relate to, to observe, and to learn from others. And we've now grown so good at this that we can learn from pretty much everyone everywhere. But funny thing is, we don't know that we know this. As we head into the middle years of the 21st century, the world is filled with known unknowns, which is another way of saying each of us. We are all the vast and poorly explored universes of experience and knowledge. As much as we might share our experiences on Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever next week's big thing might be, it's difficult for the person standing right next to us to have any idea of the treasures that we hold within us. Each of us are a vast and untapped wealth of shared resources, and we have very few tools to discover or share those resources. We need an Airbnb for our capacities so that we can freely or rent them out 
as needed. And there are bits and pieces of this already. There are sites like Airtasker or Freelancer, which allow you to employ someone's expertise as needed. But that's a tiny part of what we'd want. And it frames the individual in purely economic terms. That's a process that's often corrosive to the cohesion of a community. I cannot look out on my street, on my suburb, on my city or my state, and know who knows what. Because we've virtualized our presence, and we've separated ourselves from geography and the location that provides a level of meaning. People who are close to me, either emotionally or physically, those people have meaning to me. And we don't know enough about our neighbors, nor do we really have any easy way to learn more about them? In a country town, okay, that's, that's not going to be as true because the population density is lower. And because in a country town, your life depends on your relations in a community in a way that an urban Australian could find very confronting. But when I look out on my densely populated street in the inner city suburb of Chippendale, I wonder who lives there. I could go door to door and knock, but that, that feels like a violation of the custom of the city, which offers anonymity. It offers the safety of the crowd. And so we sit in this paradox. We're caught between the enormous capacities that lay hidden, tantalizingly, beneath the surfaces of our communities and the desire to keep our lives tidy and quiet and private and we can see the value in both. Now, there are tools like Nextdoor. It's a sort of Facebook for neighborhoods and communities. But nothing has really risen to bridge the gap between what we want to do and what we feel comfortable doing. And that line is never static. Because as we share, as we share ourselves, as we explore our experiences through social media, we redraw the boundaries between privacy and propriety. What feels safely private today might feel dangerously isolated tomorrow. All of this connectivity has amplified a social impulse that seems safe when we practice it with strangers, but feels more like a standover job when it comes to the street where we live. And so this next cultural revolution is going to take some getting used to. Part three, the human network. So where the 20th century found itself haunted by the spirit of collectivism, the 21st sees itself pervaded by a new connectivism. And yes, Connectivism can feel coercive until we need it. Consider Hong Kong. During the last few weeks, the Occupy Central movement has agitated for fully democratic elections, fighting the mandate of the Chinese central government to restrict ballot spots to pre-approved candidates. Demonstrators barricaded thoroughfares throughout the heart of the city and resisted all attempts to disrupt their efforts. And when the police pepper sprayed the crowds, what happened? A forest of shielding umbrellas popped open and gave the action its popular name, the Umbrella Revolution. Now, Hong Kong is among the most well-networked areas on Earth. The average citizen enjoys a 100 megabit broadband connection at home and pervasive high-speed mobile broadband throughout the densely urbanized municipality. And middle-class Hong Kong youth, they are all sporting recent model smartphones because they're both status symbols and necessary to navigate the social and economic life of the city. So Occupy Central organized itself online through websites and chat rooms and social media. Friends told friends about protest activities via messaging. And the crowds, once gathered, monitored police activities. They shared that information. They created a systemic awareness of and an ability to respond to counter-protest activities. 
Now, the easiest way to disrupt that kind of connectivist self-organization is simply to disrupt the mobile networks. And the authorities were rumored to be planning to do just this, despite the problems that it would cause in Hong Kong's central business district. But as soon as those rumors spread, Occupy Central protesters began to use a new messaging app known as FireChat. FireChat doesn't require mobile broadband. It doesn't require broadband of any kind. Instead, FireChat uses the Bluetooth and Wi-Fi interfaces that are on every smartphone to spread messages in a daisy chain, device to device, passing from handset to handset until a message reaches its intended destination. So using FireChat, the Umbrella Revolutionaries created their own highly resilient messaging network that allowed them to share everything they knew about everything going on within their ranks and outside the community. FireChat creates something known as a mesh network. Instead of having a hierarchy where computers talk to internet routers, which talk to bigger routers and so on, FireChat lacks any center. It's temporary, it's dynamic, Fire chat networks are created as needed with as many or as few people as desired and dissolve back into the ether as those participating within the fire chat network disperse. So disrupting a fire chat network is practically impossible. You'd have to create so much electronic noise it would wreck any electronics nearby. The umbrella revolutionaries show us that networks are made up of people not gadgets. You can snip the wires, you can jam the signals, but human networks, once forged, grow increasingly resilient. They overcome every obstacle, they share every experience, they learn from and mentor everyone within them. A human network is a capacity amplifier. The people connected with the human network will be able to do more than they can on their own, and the longer they remain within the network, the more capable they become. Now, four years ago, when I was a panelist on The New Inventors, I had the pleasure of meeting Dr. Paul Gardner-Steven. He's a professor at Flinders University. He'd come on to our show to demonstrate his project, Serval. You can think of Project Serval as the original version of FireChat. It's software that allows smartphones to create mesh networks so that mobiles can operate without mobile networks. Now, Dr. Gardner Stephen didn't have any political ends when he created Serval. The possibilities of the umbrella revolutionaries never really entered his mind. He focused Serval on something that seemed a more immediate need disaster recovery. Whenever there's a massive disaster, an earthquake, cyclone, flood, bushfire, the communications infrastructure is among the first pieces of infrastructure to be disrupted. Yet that infrastructure is among the most vital to help rescue trapped individuals in those few golden hours following the catastrophe. And so Serval allows mobiles to call one another using their actual phone numbers just as if they were still connected to the phone network. Serval is a, an impressive piece of technology and it's 100% South Australian. And it won that episode of New Inventors. Now, in the last few years, Gardner Stephen has worked with the New Zealand Red Cross and other disaster relief organizations to help equip their first responders with serval emergency phones so rescue workers can stay in constant communication. Serval and fire chat allow people to make the most of local human resources. Both work best within a few hundred meters, scaling to roughly the same area as a neighborhood or a small suburb. They allow people to reach out to those nearest to them for the help they need. They represent the kind of help we want because we want them. And they feel useful rather than creepy. And so here are the two faces of the new connectivist revolution. If you look at it one way, it seems as though our neighbors can spy on us. Now, they always could. But that's another matter. And if you look at it 
another way. We can reach out to our neighbors in a moment of need, just as they can reach us. So let's bring that back to the here and now. Australia was last week proclaimed the richest people in the world. And we certainly have all of the accoutrements of wealth, right? We've got nice houses, good cars, fancy smartphones. Almost 70% of Australians are using a smartphone now. And nearly everyone who uses a smartphone stares down into it 220 times a day. Now, we don't check the time that often. The reason we're staring into our smartphones is because they bring us news of others. We use Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and email and WhatsApp and Skype and heaven knows what else so we can feel like we belong. Now, is that feeling an illusion? These arm's length relationships, are they taking the place of messy, fleshy, face-to-face -face experiences? We can modulate our involvement through the smartphone. That's something that's very difficult to do in person. And so hiding behind the screen keeps us protected. Okay, it keeps us protected, but it also isolates us. And it would be a bitter irony if the technology of connectivity created a more fragmented and atomized society. When we most needed others, we would find out we really knew no one at all. So, how do we bring people together? Do we need to wait for a disaster? Or are there other frameworks for that kind of sharing and community? What can local and state governments do to lean into this connectivist impulse? We understand the innate desire of the connectivist within each of us, which is striving to engage and to learn and to share. And those form the starting point for our exploration. Why do people want to engage with their community or the government? Why do they want to learn? Why? What can they share? And in framing these relationships, it may be better to migrate away from an atomizing us and them toward a more inclusive we. Why do we want to engage? What do we want to learn? What can we share? Now, experiments such as your say, they open the door to engagement, but your say feels incomplete. Community engagement driven by government mandate, it's always going to feel like it's struggling to shed its us versus them framing. Your say needs to push beyond the engagement needs of the government and into the uncharted, uncontrolled territory of the needs of the community. So where is the space for an engagement that allows the community to speak to itself? Where is the fire chat or the serval that allows neighbors to talk to neighbors to offer assistance or ask for help. That's the beginning. We need to find the listeners. Where are the learners? Where are the sharers? And these are not rhetorical questions. Uh, they're asking us to rethink the scope of possibilities. People already engage. In 2014, we are engaging almost continuously. But there's a disconnect between the black mirror engagement of the smartphone and the world that's immediately around us. And as empowered as we feel in our social circles, we walk through the real world with no real sense of how to be a change maker. So we need new tools. Now, some of those tools can be developed in projects like the Unleashed Competition, which challenges developers to creatively employ all the open to all data resources provided by the South Australian government. But apps are not the answer. This is a social revolution. We need to think of new ways to connect with one another in the flesh first. The technology will follow, it always does. But it has to begin with us, where we are right now, 
and the change that we want to see. Being so rich, we may not want to change. Change is uncomfortable, it's unpredictable. So don't look to the rich to rock the boat. Look to the communities under greatest economic stress. And uh, there's a few of those in South Australia. As the automobile industry pulls out of Australia over the next three years, devastating communities here and in Victoria, this economic catastrophe creates the perfect opportunity for communities to rethink themselves, what they are, and how they work together. People who aren't under stress won't spend the time doing these things. They won't be seen as important. The people confronted by the deaths of their communities will make the time. And so, in a provocative reversal of Naomi Klein's shock doctrine, which showed how economic catastrophe created the conditions for the imposition of atomizing neoliberal economic policies, these economic disasters that are happening right now in South Australia could be harnessed to power community, to power connectivist revolutions, communities connected working together to reinvent themselves. We've already seen this in Newcastle in New South Wales. Its downtown died as the steel industry moved away, but has been reborn with Marcus Westbury's Renew Newcastle project. And those successes are being replicated in the Sydney suburb of Leichhardt and hopefully soon in Geelong. Westbury's work began long before we entered this age of unprecedented connectivity. There were years that took to bring Renew, Castle, Renew Newcastle to life, and those can now be collapsed into days with the right tools in the hands of an empowered, connected community. But to repeat, these new tools are new ways of relating within the community. They're not apps. They're new understandings giving birth to new opportunities. As changemakers, can we create new ways for communities to engage with us, learn from us, share with us? Those with the greatest needs to engage and learn and share have the most to teach us. Are we listening?